you've been redeemed. Rise and see, rise and see. If you've been touched by the mercy king, rise and sing, rise and sing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. If you're bound but now you're free, rise and sing, rise and sing. Lift up a shout of victory, rise and sing, rise and sing. Whoa. God is risen and reigning and we're elevating the glory of our God and King. Everybody rise and sing. If in your heart rings a melody, rise and sing. Rise and sing If you've tasted and have seen Rise and sing Rise and sing Whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, our God is risen and reigning And we're elevating The glory of our God and King Cause our God is risen and reigning And we're elevating the glory of our God and King Everybody rise and sing Sing hallelujah. The redeemed of the Lord sing our God reigns. The redeemed of the Lord sing hallelujah. The redeemed of the Lord sing our God reigns. Cause our God is risen and reigning And we're elevating the glory of our God and King Cause our God is risen and reigning And we're elevating the glory of our God and King Everybody rise and sing He will win 
for evil and you turn it for good. You guys believe that?
you so much. Lord, we give ourselves to you, Lord. Lord, we just give our hearts and our minds to you. We sing amen, Lord. We say amen to your will for our lives. Lord, let it be. Amen. Aren't you glad you serve a God who wants to bless you? Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to ask Ian to come forward this morning, if he would. This is Ian's last Sunday with us doing his internship here. I want to say as he's coming forward, if you want to bless him this morning with an offering, if you would uh, designate that on your offering envelope, as we'll be taking up the offering here in a few minutes. But I want to make sure that uh, we give him something to bless him because he has definitely blessed us. Amen. And uh, Ian, I just want to let you know we're going to miss you and... uh, We've uh, put you to the task a number of times. At least I know Joe has. Yes. <laughs> and uh, and uh, anything you want to say to the congregation and, uh, this morning? I just want to say thank you. Uh, it's been an absolute honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, you guys are in great hands. I want to thank Pastor Rick personally. I remember calling him in May, and uh, we had a good conversation, and that's where it started. Then we went to Roxanne's with Pastor Joe, and... Um, Really boomy. Yeah, Had a got... really, really good lunch there. And Pastor Joe's been great. Um, just trust the leaders here because they are being led by the Spirit. Pastor Jason, Pastor Tina, Pastor Rick, and Pastor Joe, thank you guys so much for having me. It's been an absolute blast. I'm excited to come back. Thank you. Oh, praise the Lord. Save for a second. This is a guy that any task we threw at him, he said, okay, I'll do it. And um, I'm sure he's not sure what he walked into half the time. And um, I get tickled just thinking about a few things that I'm not even going to mention. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, I love this guy. I've come to love him and appreciate what he does. I think God's got a great future for him. Amen. Could we do one thing before we take up the offering? Could you stand with me this morning? And I want you to just extend forth the hand. Let's just pray a blessing over him that God will continue to guide him. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, dear God, for the people you put in my life, people like Ian. And I ask right now, dear Lord, may you guide him. May you cover him, dear Father. I know you've got great plans for him. His future is bright, dear God, because he's following you. So I ask, dear God, may he continue to have that sensitive spirit, dear God, that spirit, dear Lord, that serving spirit. And dear Lord, may you continue to use him in a mighty way, dear God. And thank you for letting us uh, be a part and enjoy this experience with him. Dear Lord, may you bless him in every way, and we ask it in the name of Jesus. Everybody said amen. 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 Thank, you, Thank you, my friend. Appreciate it. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I want to ask our ushers to come forward this morning. You know, when we think of worship, uh, so often we think of People singing, playing a guitar like we had this morning. We think of clapping. We think about raising our hands. Uh, while all of these things can be worship, I think worship is much bigger than that, than just the songs that we sing on Sunday morning. How many of y'all believe that? Our life should be worship. Everything, everything we do has the potential to be worship. And you'll read a passage in, by, by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12. He says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, In view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. There's a a phrase there, living sacrifice. And when you look at that, that, that phrase, it sounds kind of contradictory because a sacrifice is usually, um, well, during that time, it was something you killed. And uh, that's why it was a sacrifice. And yet, when I look at this, what Paul is saying actually is that we, that we be a living sacrifice. It's true and proper worship on our part to do that, to be a living sacrifice. And one of the ways that we do that is that we can be a living sacrifice in our marriages, in our jobs, uh, even in our budget, in our tithes. The 10% that belongs to God, our offerings, the extra that we give above our tithes. And... Uh, I say that because I believe that when we give like we do this morning, we do it as an act of worship. So basically, it's just a carry-on from our singing, the offering. It's simply a carry-on from the, from the part of raising our hands and praising the Lord. It's another act of worship. So I just challenge you this morning. I want to thank you for your faithfulness because we would not have a place to worship if it wasn't for the fact of your act of worship. And because of that, God blesses. Amen. 
So Heavenly Father, I ask you to bless this offering this morning. Dear Lord, may you bless it. Those that give to our church, dear God, those that want to bless Ian as well, dear Lord, may we realize that all that we give is an act of worship towards you. Dear Lord, may you use it in a mighty way, and may you bless those who give, and we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want you to look in your bulletin. You'll see a blue sheet of paper to kind of help you along this morning. We've been talking about shaping your future self. And in my previous messages, I kind of explained that in uncertain times, uh, when you can't figure out what really is going on in life, um, God doesn't want you just to drift around with no plans. He wants you to plan something in your life. And I talked about the fact that um, I believe in sometimes he wants us to shorten our plans because we make long-term plans that we never really fulfill sometimes. So uh, shorten your, your plans, shorten your goals, and uh, believe in and trusting that God's going to help you. And I talked about having a 100-day plan. Some of you came up to me in the past week and said, I'm working on my 100-day plan. And I said, well, work on it, but start doing it. <laughs> Sometimes we work on things that we never plan. We never do it. So I said two areas, if you remember. One was your personal goals, and one was your spiritual goals. Work on two areas, a 100-day plan that you can find out for your life and uh, it'll help you shape your future self. And I'm proud of you guys that are doing that, because if you're doing that, that means you're stepping out in faith and making a plan that God has for you uh, in the middle of tough times, hard times. I'm just curious, how many of you are, and maybe in the past year has gone through some hard times or tough times, or maybe you're going through them right now? Just raise your hand. Okay, I see quite a few. And uh, there's something about that. You might say, well, I'm not going through any. I'll tell you what, this morning, there'll be a time when you will. Isn't that an encouraging thought? And we'll say amen and go home on that. Uh, I want to help you with having de or developing some habits that help us hold on in hard times. And what I want to share with you this weekend or this, this morning is uh, not some theory. It's actually something that I've, I've applied to my life many times, and I think it's important. And uh, I've been through rough patches. I've been through hard times. I've been through tough, difficult circumstances in my life. And I've learned that when you go through those experiences, it's important that you trust God, uh, you trust His Word, you develop some habits in your life that help you keep on keeping on. Because if not, you're going to quit. And we have a lot of quitters right now in our world today. People just say, I quit, and they walk away. And God wants you to keep on keeping on in your life. He's got a plan, something he wants you to do. When you develop these habits, it helps you hold on in the hard times, and it helps you keep going until the circumstances get better. And how many of y'all have found that any hard time you've been through, eventually the circumstances do get better? There is a turn, but it sure stinks when you're going through them. It's just a rotten experience. I mean, when you're going through hell, what do you want to do? Keep walking, man. Don't stop right there. Keep on moving. And uh, and you might say, well, I don't need this today. You may need it next week. You may need it right now. I don't know. I don't know what you're going through. But uh, nobody escapes hard times. It's simply a part of our life. So it's so important. It's so essential that you get this. And what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to take a part of this. And actually, it's going to be like a three-week uh, segment. It's a long message, in other words. And I didn't want you guys to miss lunch, so I'm going to cover just a couple this week, give you some bite sizes to kind of think about today. In fact, if you look at your sheet of paper, if you got your hand out, there's nothing on the backside. So you got a whole free backside to fill out and, uh, and to use, maybe with this message. That doesn't mean it's going to be a, sh a half message, okay? And uh, just, just setting you guys up so you understand that. Uh, it's funny with these handouts because sometimes you guys will fill in the last line and then you're checked out. And like, okay, he's done now, so I can get ready to leave. And sometimes I think it's almost important that I, I have one last line for you to fill out at the end so you listen to the entire message, so you get all the way through it. But um, how many of y'all know that life is not a 50-yard dash, it's a marathon? How many of y'all are discovering that? It's a, it's a, you have a ways to go. It requires endurance. It requires persistence. It requires, uh, faith. It requires resilience in your life. And, but there's some habits that you can learn to help you make it through the rough patches. And I'm going to kind of help you with that, I think, this morning. And if I can be honest with you, over 42 years now of pastoring, uh, there have been rough times that the devil's thrown my way, I think, that, or people. And, uh, God uses people that I, I felt like giving up. There have been times that I've just wanted to quit and say, you know, I've had enough. And uh, 
And I've always had to go back to some of these basic habits in my life to help me hold on and make it through the tough times. Following Christ is not a, a single step, it's a journey of faith. So if you can find, develop these habits in your life, I believe it will help you. Colossians 2, 6 says this, you have accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord. Now keep on following him. That keep on, you're going to find uh, throughout scripture. It's a phrase that's used a lot in the New Testament. And uh, keep on, keep on, keep on, keeping on with Jesus. So how do you do that? You do it by learning some habits that help you hold on in the hard times. And these things I'm doing right now in my life, if I can be honest. And there are things that you can do. It's a habit that you can develop. So let's start with number one. Number one is this. Keep my life clean. You might say, well, that is very basic. Yes, it is. Keep my life clean. In other words, keep a clear conscience. And um, I saw a sign at a gas station one time, and it said this, a clean engine has more power. And I began thinking, you know what? That's true. That's also true in our lives. A clean life has more power. There's something about it. And uh, when you're going through life with a clear conscience, you have a lot more power than nothing drains you faster than guilt, regret, and shame. They have a way of just destroying and weakening your life. And you feel like you're hiding something. Uh, my favorite class in high school was history. I had a great history teacher. And I enjoy reading history and about church, great uh, church history and great men and, and women of history. And I would say with all of them, all of them went through tough times in their life. And Having a clean life was important, and I think it's important in our lives. And I have found that with many of them, there was always a refinement before a new assignment. And sometimes God, I think, allows tough times in our life. It's a refinement that takes place before God gives you a new assignment, something now, he says, now you're ready to do it. And now you're prepared to step into the task that I have. And whenever I read the kind of stuff that some of these people did, I think, God, I want that in my life. I want to have a life like that, and if you study their secrets, the first step usually is having a, a clean life, keeping my life clean. It's a personal cleansing that takes place, and I think God uses holy, clean people. Not perfect people, holy, clean people. If you're waiting to get perfect to have God use you, guess what? You're never going to quite get there, okay? Because the minute you get there, pride kicks into your life, and now you're not perfect anymore. You've already got a problem. But God uses clean, holy people. And if God only used perfect people, nobody would ever be used. So we have to come to a point where we understand this because none of us except Jesus was perfect. And without exception, anytime in history or today, you can find God using somebody. They've kept their life clean. You might say, well, I know a lot of people who have messed up their lives and God is still, is, is still used them. Well, yes, they did. But you know what they probably did? They probably cleaned up their life. They came to a point where they realized I've got to make some changes. Something's got to be different in my life, so I've got to keep my life my life clean. They dealt with their personal sin in their life, and they have gotten it clean. Not perfect, but they're cleansed. And I think that's something important. 2 Timothy 2.21 says this, If you keep yourself pure, you will be a utensil that God can use for his purpose. Your life will be clean, and you will be ready for the master to use for every good work. But it starts with cleaning up my life. It starts with confession um, and, and cleansing. Augustine, the great theologian, said this, the confession of bad works is the beginning of good works. Getting things taken care of in your life. In 1 Peter 3.16, the message, it says this, keep a clear conscience before God. Why? So that when people throw mud at you, none of it will stick. I like that. So when people throw mud at you, none of it will stick. I love that. One of the benefits of integrity, of having integrity, and you've heard me say this before, live in such a way that people have to make up stuff about you to accuse you. Live that type of life. The Bible says in Romans 12, 9, hate what is evil, hold on to what is good. What does that mean? Well, that means that you certainly don't want to hold on to garbage in your life. I'm just curious, how many of you here, after you've had dinner, you throw your dishes in the, di in, in the sink, and then the next morning, you want to have breakfast, and you just pull the dishes out of the sink and use them again. You don't bother cleaning them. You don't do that, do you? I'm so glad nobody raised their hand. Yeah. 
I'm into a dirty fork, man. <laughs> you know, I like dirty knives. No, you clean them. You get them clean. You clean them before you use them. In our lives, in our spiritual life, we need to be cleaned. We don't need to carry the garbage in our life. I don't want you having a big sack of garbage, uh, of guilt, regrets, shame, and stuff that you're afraid people are going to find out about because it's just unnecessary weight in your life. You have to dump it. You need to get rid of it. How do you dump the load of guilt and shame and, and regret in your life? How do you dump the load of fear in your life? Well, it's real simple. It's through confession. And the Bible talks about confessing our sins, not to a, not to a man. I don't want you coming and confessing your sins to me. You confess your sins to God. I can't cleanse you. He can. Confess your sins to God. And that word confession, um, and the Greek is homo legeo, and homo means the same, logeo means to speak, and to speak the same. Basically, it's the idea that I confess to God, you're right, I'm wrong. I understand that now. I'm on the same page with you. How many of y'all want to be on the same page with God? Amen. Whatever he says, that's what go. The Bible says if we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But it comes to a point where we basically uh, go agree with him. If you're going through a hard time, the first thing you got to do is get rid of some unnecessary garbage in your life. The weight that you're carrying right now, you should not be carrying. I mean, God doesn't want you to walk around in guilt. He doesn't want you to walk around in shame. He doesn't want you to walk, walk around with a, a load of regrets. He wants you to let those things go. And the first habit, I keep my life clean. And... I already know some people are going to say, well, you're talking about a life of purity. I really am. Yeah, that's what I am talking about. Uh, I'm just amazed sometimes at the excuses people give for why they live the way they do. Well, you know, it's just the world we're living in nowadays, and you need to understand culture. Listen, this Bible never changed. It's still the same standard. I don't care what the culture is going through. I don't care what the world's going through. I have to adhere my life to this book. In fact, not only do I have to do it, you have to do it. That's the way you live a pure life. You begin to realize what is taking place. Rather than carrying the unnecessary junk that the culture says is acceptable, we accept what the Word of God says. And I know some of you are thinking, well, Rick, I, I'm not sure I can even remember all the things that I've done. I uh, unconsciously, I have unconscious guilt. I know I've done things wrong, and I can't even remember what they all, all, all are. So what do I do? Well, I think a great thing you can do is ask God to show you. Psalms 139. I, you can memorize this verse, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. Point out anything that you see in me that offends you. And lead me in the way everlasting. That's a scripture that if you can nail that down and make that a part of your life, it's like a searchlight verse. It's basically saying, God, turn it on to me. I don't even know the things I'm unconsciously regretting that I feel ashamed about. I know the conscious stuff, but God, I want you to bless my life. I want that. So if you're hearing me this morning, God wants to use your life and he wants to help you live a life where you have a clear conscience. Now, no matter what's happened in the past, no matter what you've done, how long you've done it, who you've done it with, it doesn't matter. God wants to bless you and use your life. He wants to take that past and wipe it out so you don't remember it. So you can live with a, a clear conscience because he paid that price. He wants you to let go of the garbage. He wants you to get your life clean through confession and, and be washed clean. Here's what I've discovered. God uses small vessels. God uses plain vessels. God even uses broken vessels. We're all broken and cracked up a little bit. I don't know if God necessarily uses dirty vessels. He wants you to be clean. He wants to bless your life. The one thing maybe holding you back, blessing your life, is unconfessed sin. A lot of junk in your life. You know, when you're carrying garbage around in the garbage sack from your past, what you do is you don't ignore it. You don't pretend it's not there. You don't repress it. You don't suppress it. You confess it. Lord, I give this to you. I agree with you, God. That was wrong. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Now, I'm just curious how many of y'all have ever said 
I agree with you, God. I know I was wrong. Please forgive me. He forgets about it and you don't. Ever been there? You keep rehashing. That's when the enemy begins to tell you, you know what? You can't possibly serve the God with all the screw-ups you have in your life. I've seen people who have done amazing screw-ups in their life who are now doing amazing things. And listen, I love you guys. And I want to tell you, in hard times, there is nothing that's going to give you greater resilience, give you more personal power than a clear conscience. God, I thank you that you cleanse. How many of y'all remember the day you gave your heart to Jesus? I'm just curious. Raise your hands. Some of you don't remember. Maybe you haven't given your heart to the Lord. That might be the first thing. And uh, But do you remember that when you gave your heart to Jesus, you walked out thinking, man, I feel so good. I feel so clean because you knew that he paid a price you could not pay. But how many of y'all have found that as the years go by and you've been saved for numbers of years that you have a hard time when you keep saying, Lord, I, man, I screwed up again. And how many of y'all are just amazed by his grace that he says, uh, I'll forgive you again? Because that's not our natural tendency. Well, our natural tendency is to say, I'm not a sucker. You've done it to me once, you've done it to me twice, you've done it to three times, I'm remembering now, and you hang on to it. The shame of it is, is that God wants us to forgive the way he forgives. He wants us to understand that very concept. And I, I want you to be blessed in your life. So how do you get to this point where I think purity is the key to power in your life, the first step anyways, and, and how do I keep my life clean? How do I do this? Let me give you a couple of points real quick. Number one, you can write them someplace on the back sheet of the paper or something, just so you can remember them or listen to it later on. Number one is get alone with God. That's the first thing I would suggest. Get alone with God and um, get out a blank sheet of paper. That's why I gave you the back side. You can get a pencil or a pen. Sit alone with God. And the first thing you do is you pray. And what you pray is, I would pray Psalms 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me, anything that offends you, and lead me in the way everlasting. After you do that, start writing down whatever comes to your mind. Jealousy, anger, lying, lust, whatever failure to do something, failure to not do something, and then ask him, is there anything else, Lord? <laughs> and wait a while, because how many of you know that when you ask him, is there anything else, Lord, and you wait, he usually gives you something. Yeah, you could also take care of this. And, uh, and then don't just say, God, forgive me of all my sins. Um, you've committed these sins individually, so I would say uh, confess them individually. Nothing really becomes dynamic until it becomes specific. So get very specific about your sins. And point out, say, God, you know, I, I cheated that person. I gossiped about this person. And I was resentful. I was bitter. I was jealous. And whatever it is, write it all down. Pause. Wait. Is there anything else? Because you don't want any garbage left in your life. Once you've written it all down, um, you, get, you look at your list and you're pretty overwhelmed. And... Um, you agree with God. You say, hey, you're right. That was wrong. I'm sorry. And then what you can do is write across that list, 1 John 1, 9. Write down 1 John 1, 9. And here's what it says. If we confess our sins, that's our part. That's the premise. Here's the promise. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You've done your part. He does his part. Amen? So what do you do with that list then? You throw it in the garbage. Throw it away, burn it, do something with it, get rid of it. You know why? Because if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us. In other words, that is done away with. You don't need it anymore. Praise the Lord. I don't need it anymore. He took care of price. He did something that I could not do. And what is standing between you and a clear conscience if you don't take care of it, it's usually pride. So come to a point where you give it to him. Piece of paper, a pen, sit down, make out that list. Now, I will tell you something that I've discovered. You may feel some emotion, or you may feel no emotion. And, um, and 
this has nothing to do with emotion. It's simply a choice. It's a choice saying that I'm taking a spiritual bath. It's a choice saying that I admit and forsake any known sin. It's a choice that says I'm going to do the right thing. And my guess is, is that some of you right now can relate to how David felt in Psalms 51. Here's what it says. God, I've been out of step with you for a long time. This is uh, the message. I've been out of step with you for a long time. What you're after, Lord, is truth from the inside out. Soak me in your laundry and I'll come out clean. Scrub me and I'll have a snow white life. God, make a fresh start in me. Shape a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. Don't you love that translation? Isn't that powerful? In other words, God, give me a fresh start. How many of y'all have ever felt so glad you can have a fresh start? Man, I can't tell how many times in my life I have needed a fresh start. I've needed God to put me in his spiritual washing machine and put some soap suds in there and go to work on me. Because there's no way I can clean up the screw-ups in my life. And there's no way you can clean up the screw-ups in my life. But I serve a God who can. And you know what he gives me? He gives me a Genesis week from the chaos of my life. He gives me a fresh start. Now, I want to say something. If that is you this morning, you can settle those issues in your life right now. In fact, um, you can simply say, Lord, I give you my life. I give you my mess. And uh, show me any sin that's hindering my walk with you. And I turn it over to you. My challenge for you is that you do that this, this week. You spend some time alone with God so that you can keep your life clean. Here's what Job 17, 9 says. The righteous will hold on to his way, and he who has clean hands will be stronger and stronger. How many of y'all want to be stronger and stronger, not weaker and weaker? All right. Amen. You want to be spiritually strong, even in tough times. Psalms 24, 3 through 5 says this. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul on the vanity nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessings of the Lord. How many of y'all want blessings from the Lord? You start with number one here. Keep my life clean. What's the second one? You can write it down. This is it. Keep my eyes open. Keep my eyes open. You need to be more aware. You need to be more alert to what God is doing in tough times than in other times because God wants to teach you in the middle of those times. He wants to teach you during your tough times. Psalms 105 verse 4 says this in the message. Keep your eyes open for God. Are you looking for God and everything in your life? That's what it is. Keep your eyes open for God. Watch for his works. Be alert for signs of his presence. But we're talking about here, eyes open, be alert, watch. Um, I'm going to use the word vision this morning that I think applies maybe to this, this very idea. I think sometimes we have the wrong understanding of, of vision, and um, it's often misunderstood. I don't think vision is just predicting the future, because I don't think anybody can really predict the future, and um, except for God. I mean, we, can't, we didn't predict 9-11. We didn't predict um, terrorist attacks. We didn't predict mass shootings, the COVID pandemic. And um, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, much less next week. We're just hoping we get to tomorrow. So when I think about vision, I'm thinking of the idea of... Um, the idea of two things. One is keeping my eyes open. It's a habit of vision where I'm always looking around me, seeing what is taking place. And I think vision can be, my idea of vision for this morning can be two things. One is, is seeing God at work in your present situation. Okay. Seeing God at work in your present situation and moving on it. In other words, taking advantage of what's happening right now. Vision in this sense is this is how God's working right now. This is what's going on. I want to respond to that. I want to be a part of that. In other words, if it's a big wave, I want to catch the wave. I'm not a surfer. I would be a terrible surfer. It'd be kind of like a, a beached whale on a surfboard. The waves would probably shoot right by me. But how many of y'all have ever seen a good surfer? A good surfer knows how to see a wave as it's coming. And they catch the wave and they ride it. I believe in the spiritual sense, we should be spiritual surfers. We should see the way that's coming, that God is bringing our way, have the ability to jump on it and ride the wave that God has for us. Not 10 years down the road, right now. 
the things that God is doing. So vision is not necessarily predicting the wave in 10 years. Vision is seeing what God is doing. Vision is setting your sail to God's wind. I'm not a sailor, but I used to have a brother-in-law who knew how to sail. And he says, yeah, he says, you can be out there in a boat and you can, you can see the, kind of like see the wind coming. Know when to put up your sails. How many of y'all, if you were like me, you'd just be stuck out there? You know, wind? Where are you? Oh, the wind's blowing the wrong direction. I'm never going to get back into shore. I think it was my dad who actually got on one of those uh, boards with a sail. What do they call those? Surfboard with a sail. I don't know what they're called. He got on one. He had no problem getting out there. Wind was blowing out to sea. He just surfed his way out there. The problem was the wind was still blowing out when he had to go back in. He's not a surfer or a sailor. <laughs> and uh, he had no clue. I think they finally had to go out and get him because he just kept going farther and farther out. And uh, I think with me, I probably would have de- dropped my sail and paddled in. But I don't know what he did. He'll tell me in two weeks after he's heard this message and uh, what's going on. The key is, though, if God's got the wind blowing, you got to get your sails up. Ride the wind that he has right now for your life. And sometimes I think we need to stop praying, God, bless what I'm doing. Okay? I think we need to start praying, God, help me do what you're blessing. Help me do what you're blessing. I want to be a part of it. I want to ride that wind. Keep your eyes open. Every morning, I try to begin my day by saying, Lord, I know you're going to do a lot of really cool things today, and, and give me the privilege of being on that wave. Be, give me the privilege of, of riding the wind that you've set for today. And I think one of the things that churches need right now in the world that we're living in to do the right thing is not just go after people who are unchurched. I think right now what the church needs to do, not just going after those who don't know Christ, those that are lost, I think we need to go after people who are de-churched since COVID. They've not been back since COVID. They've become de-churched. And, um, and a lot of people are just left out there for this reason or that reason, and they're out there just floating around. I was talking with a farmer yesterday, and he says, yeah, he says, what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor, and we got talking and just making casual conversation, and I said, what do you do? He goes, oh, I'm, I'm a farmer. I said, oh, well, you know, he says, yeah, I'm a Christian. I said, what church you go to? Oh, I've not been to church since COVID. I said, oh, really? I said, so what do you do? He said, I'm not really doing anything. He was very honest. He said, oh, I'm a farmer. I'm busy. And I said, okay. And I said, do you, does it make you feel a little awkward talking to me? <laughs> he goes, yeah, it really does. <laughs> he said, I probably should be in church. I said, Great. Is it tomorrow Sunday? Where are you going to go? He goes, I knew you were going to ask me that question. <laughs> so we talked for a bit longer. I says, what church were you going to? And he named a church. And um, I says, wouldn't it be great if they saw you there tomorrow? He says, you're right. He says, you know what? I'll go. I says, do I need to call you tomorrow after church? He goes, no, no, you don't need to do that. He said, I promise you I will be in church. Here's the deal, is we have a lot of de-churched people in our world today. Since COVID, they watch watched it online, and then eventually, honestly, I don't think a whole lot of them even watch it online sometimes. They've just kind of become de-churched. And you know what, folks? I don't know about you, but I miss the de-churched people. I miss people that I, we used to see here that aren't going anywhere. So I want to challenge you. Maybe that's something that we can reach out after because I believe that they need Jesus just like we do. And they're just simply floating around. So let me tell you what else is vision. Vision is seeing how you can use a good idea. And maybe somebody else has thought it up, but it applies to your situation. Proverbs 18.15 says this, Wise men and women are always learning, always listening, So they're learning and listening for fresh insights. Did you know that it says there that a mark of wisdom, a mark of intelligence, a mark of being wise is that you learn. You're learning from other people. And uh, the fact that you're in church today lets me know that you're all brilliant. Because you've made a choice to come to church to learn something. That's part of why you're here. And part of what takes place. So I give you honor this morning. 
Because I find that when you're going through rough times, the Bible, the habits that help us hold on, keep our lives clean, keep our eyes open, I find is sometimes simply learning. Leaders never stop learning. We learn through the good in our lives and we learn through the bad in our lives. We learn through the good in other people's lives and the bad in other people's lives. But we always are learning. We're learning something that's taking place, especially even in our rough times. And it's interesting that you can learn from anybody if you know the right questions. I was with a farmer yesterday, and after five minutes with him, I learned things I didn't know. You know why? Because everybody's ignorant on different subjects. I taught him things. He said, I never knew that about church. And we got talking, well, that's because I know things he knows, and he knows things I know. Or I don't know. And consequently, I learned some new things. That's why iron sharpens iron. And uh, we learn from one another. I've learned from bigger churches, and I've learned from smaller churches. I've learned uh, from my enemies. In fact, I think that makes me smarter than my enemy because they're not learning from me, but I'm learning from them. I often think of a time in my life when I, I was a kicker in high school in football. And that was one of the things I, one of my positions. And uh, there was a guy named Tank that played on one of the other teams. And he'd always tell me, and I just wasn't learning, he'd say, um, I got your number. I wasn't sure what he was talking about. I thought he wore the same jersey I did or something. When I kicked off, his job was to take me out. And the first kickoff in every game, I'd be flying down the field, and here would come Tank, and he would pace me from the side, and I'd be rolling around the ground. You know what I learned from that? Look for Tank the next time you kick off. I knew I could outrun him. I just had to find him because his job was to take me out. That was his job. You, we can learn from anybody in our lives. I, um, you don't have to be the person that thinks up everything. I know of a missionary who once said, I'm going to be original or nothing. And you know what? He accomplished both. And uh, most boring guy you could ever listen to. That probably wasn't nice. But it was true. And uh, so here's what I'm trying to say this morning. If, if you think you can't imitate, copy, or learn from other people, that's nonsense. There are people in this church I greatly admire, and I watch their lives. And some of you know who you are. I learn from you. Keep your life clean. Keep your eyes open. Philippians 3.17 says this, Brothers, this is Paul talking, Brothers, be united in imitating me. I circle that word imitating. Keep your eyes fixed on those who act according to the example you have from me. Four times I think Paul talks about basically imitation. Follow me as I follow Christ. And for a long time, I couldn't imagine myself ever saying that to anybody. Uh, hey, you guys follow me as I follow Christ. To me, it sounded very uh, arrogant and very prideful. Until I began thinking about that scripture, and I began to realize I would rather have you follow me than follow some sinner out there. I'd rather follow, have you follow my example, the good and the bad. There are things that I do, there are things that I say, honestly, even on Sunday mornings from the pulpit, that I kick myself the minute I said it. I thought, why did that come out of my mouth? I hope you've learned from me not to say that. And uh, some of the youth, youth but he'd say, could you believe the pastor said that? I guess I talked about butts last Sunday and that became part of the conversation. I am sorry, but let me say something to you this morning, very honestly. If you had to get up here every single Sunday and I critiqued you the way you critique me, you'd be in trouble. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. It's easier said than done. Because usually when I'm thinking about what I'm saying, I'm also thinking about what I'm going to say. And usually that gets me in trouble. And, um, and I just want to say I apologize, but I'd rather have you follow me to have you follow some of the yahoos out there that are just living big, screwed-up lives. At least I can tell you I stumble, I fall, I make mistakes at time. I'm imperfect, but I'm a child of the king, and I know who he is. I'm skipping all that. I think I'll skip that also. Let's bow our heads. <laughs> 
I want God's power in your life. I want you to even go through tough times. And believe me, when you're going through tough times, it's the greatest time to be an example to those around you. Let them see what God is doing in your life. I, uh, I read an article out of uh, Harvard Business Review. I actually clipped it out. It says, imitation often beats innovation. Innovation's become an idol in our society. We think that if we have to come up with something new and original, when I think there's a lot of stuff that's already been written that's great to follow. Doesn't need to be changed. Doesn't need to be created. It's right here in the Word of God. So I want you to look at your life this morning. Does your pride keep you from learning from other people? Are you able to see the vision that God has? I honestly don't know what hard times any of you are going through. I know some of you, what you're going through. And I, I care about you and I love you and I'm praying for you. But I tell you, these two habits today, if you can begin right here, it'll help you not only strive, it'll help you survive in your life, no matter what situation you're going through. Keep my life clean, keep my eyes open, uh, keep my heart grateful. And here's the deal, you may know about Christ, but do you know Christ? So I want you to bow your heads. If you can say, Pastor, you know what? I'm going through a crisis in my life. I'm going through situations. I want to ask you this. Have you completely surrendered every area of your life to Jesus? And if you haven't, this morning you know you need to, I want you just to raise your hand for a moment. I want to pray for you. Yes. Anybody else this morning? Yes. Yes, I've surrendered my life to Jesus, but I've not surrendered every area. Sometimes we hang on to areas. But this morning, I want to do that. Anybody else, just raise your hand. We're going to pray. Yes. Yes. Anybody else this morning? Complete surrender to the Lord. Yes. Keep my life clean. Keep my eyes open. Could you stand with me this morning? I believe that some of you here this morning were a little leery to even raise your hand because there are certain things you don't want to let go of. And I'm challenging you this morning, even right now, you can still let go of them. Simply give them to Jesus. So I want you to do something this morning. If you're next to somebody, just put your hand on their shoulder. Because I know that if you're praying for them, they'll be praying for you. If you don't know who that person is, you might want to say, what's your name? Get acquainted real quick. But let's pray for one another that we can keep our lives clean, keep our eyes open. Hey, Amen. Some of you are huddling together. That's good. I love when family does that. So, Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. As much as we know how, we want you to be the manager of our lives in every single area. Dear God, we want your Son to be the manager of our lives. We surrender every area. We surrender our future, our health, our body. We surrender our finances, our relationships, our dreams, every part of us. And what we're saying this morning is we want you to call the shots. In hard times in our life, we want to develop habits that will help us hang on to you. Help us live a clean life. And this week, dear God, we want to spend time with you doing a, a cleansing project. We know we can't clean up ourselves, but we can give you everything that we are. And you can make our lives clean. You can open up our eyes. You can teach us things that we never knew. And because of it, we can give you a grateful heart. Because we realize that literally everything is a gift from you. So right now, dear Jesus, we open up that door to our hearts. And as we often pray, dear God, when we partake of communion, we ask you to walk in and look in the closets. Look in the darkest areas of our lives. Reveal that to us that we might confess our sins. Give them to you, dear God, and because of the price you paid, we can have a life that's pure. 
a life that's clean, a life that you can use. Dear God, use us, touch us, speak to us. May this be a week, dear God, where people see you in us because we've gotten everything else out of the way. We thank you that the only way we can have a clean heart is by the price that you paid. So I thank you for that today, Lord. I thank you that you cover up our screw-ups and you give us a life of success because we're trusting in you. Dear Lord, guide us through this week. May our lives be changed because of your power, the price that you paid. And dear Lord, may we be able to walk in victory. May we see the wave that is coming, the wind that is blowing. And may we be able to ride what you've prepared for us. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen, amen. Just a reminder, this is a great week to go to a small group, get involved with somebody maybe you don't know. If you have any questions, call our office. We'll let you know what small groups are available, what's out there right now. But a great week to get started, get reacquainted, and uh, tell someone you love them around where you're sitting and actually mean it. Amen. God bless you.